Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Sure, well, well, thank you. Um, Let's go around and say our names. My name is Jim. Larry. Sean. George. Marty. Clint. Richard. Lee. Paul. Jack. Mark. I'm Steve. Nicholas. Mike. Fernando. Brett. Michael. Ed? Vipassana. Hey. Bob. Max. John. Robert. David. David. Jim. John. Kay. Steven. Jim. Rolf. Rolf. Lewis. Kevin. Howard. Wait, anyone here for the first time? Welcome. There's a sign-up sheet um, if you would like to get emails and newsletters. So nice to have a beautiful woman in the room. It's good to be here. Um, and beautiful quality. Sean is a doctoral student at California Institute of Integral Studies, and he is um, working with um, Ken Wilber. Uh, he spent five months in Bhutan on an environmental project. Um, what is the, your thesis topic? It's on environmental philosophy and intersubjectivity. You have spoken on that. Yeah. That's great. Well, welcome back. Thank yeah, you. thank you. It's always great to be at GBF, so I just want to thank you all for having me back. It's a little odd speaking away from you, but um, I guess I will just bear that. Um, a number of you were here the last time I spoke about Bhutan, um, which was just kind of an overview of my time there, the project I worked on, and some aspects of the culture and Buddhism in particular in Bhutan, which is a derivative of Tibetan Buddhism. And when Clint asked me to come back and speak again, I thought it might be appropriate to focus this time on the Bhutanese sacred da mask dances. Um, and with the opportunity of presenting slides that allows me a chance to really kind of give a sense of what do these dances look like. And so before I begin the slideshow, I just want to say a few things about the dances. I also brought a few books that people can look at afterwards that describe the dances in more detail. But essentially, the dances take place throughout Bhutan in all the various valleys. Bhutan's a very small country and it's divided by very high mountain ranges. And because of these high mountain ranges, Bhutan holds an elevation range from 700 feet to about 15,000 feet. So there's quite a lot of biodiversity as a result and there's a lot of cultural diversity. Um, and one of the unifying aspects of the culture, in spite of its diversity, are these dances that take place throughout the country in the various valleys. Now, there are a few dances that occur in almost every valley, but in addition to that, each valley has particular dances that are specific to its region and to maybe some of the various religious texts that were discovered in that area. So there's enough splendor that even if you're seeing a dance in one valley that you saw in another valley, it's still so beautiful and just presented in just enough of a different way that you feel like you're seeing an entirely new dance. In Bhutan, there's the Terma tradition, which is connected with Guru Rinpoche, who was kind of the leading proponent of Vajrayana Buddhism in the Himalayan region. And he is reported to have hidden thousands of sacred texts in rocks, trees, lakes, and in midair. 
And since his time in like the 8th century, there have been a number of turtons or treasure revealers who have come along and in a sense downloaded those sacred texts from their hidden place in the natural world and presented them to the religious community. The dances, almost all of the dances are based on these terma texts. And so they tell various stories or describe various aspects of the scripture um, in a dramatized form. And that's why they're considered sacred. The festival takes place once a year in each valley and lasts for three days. And it's kind of the one opportunity where people come together from all around the surrounding region and just party. They drink a lot of beer, they sit in the hot sun and watch the dances for three days straight. They usually go from eight in the morning to about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then they play games and have archery competitions and do a number of other kind of festive cultural events. And the dances in various valleys, they take place throughout the year. So if you're a Bhutanese mass dance junkie, you can basically tour the country throughout the whole year watching different dances. Some dances are connected to the harvest, some are connected to planting, some are connected to various kind of aspects of the cycles that the Bhutanese agricultural communities kind of, you know, dealt with throughout the year. And the dances are performed by monks generally, though in between each monk dance, there's a group of women who will come out and do a folk dance which again is kind of the Vajrayana commitment to a balance between the masculine and the feminine as well as the sacred and the profane. And I think I spoke a little bit last time about how in addition to the sacred mass dances, there's also what are called ostras, which are jokers or jesters that walk around and make fun of the dancers as they're performing the sacred dance. And they mock them and they make fun of them, they try and distract them. They tell jokes, dirty jokes, to the community that's sitting around. And it's it's quite a riot. um, Because if you start to get bored with the dancing, then you just can focus on the clowns. And they keep you pretty entertained. Because the dances are so repetitious, for a Westerner, they can be pretty monotonous in a certain way. Um, It kind of takes a while to sink into the repetition and learn to appreciate it. So I think that's enough of an overview. The slides also include some of the natural aspects of Bhutan and some of my personal um, you know, relationship to Bhutan. So I've included that as well. There will be moments where I will just click on a slide and not say anything and just keep passing through because I want to try and get through the slideshow as quick as possible so that we can then have somewhat of a discussion afterwards. So with all that, Um, If there are any questions, I'll entertain them now, or I'll just jump in. Okay, here we go. This is a Mani Stone, which is a rock that has Om Mani Buddy Hong carved onto it. So it's like a mantra stone, and they're all over Bhutan. And this was actually a pile of them, um, where these stones were scattered throughout this whole collection of rocks. This is my house, that little white thing up in the corner is where I lived for the five months I was there. And kind of down below it is part of the community that was nearby and where I worked. Another close-up of my house. It was so amazing to be living there after living in San Francisco for three years. (laughs) This is inside my house. Because I was only there for five months, I didn't have the opportunity or the need to really buy furniture. So you can just see I made use of the floor. This is my kitchen. There's my refrigerator with the tomatoes on the the seal. Um, There's my cupboard. There's my cabinets. And that's my bed. I have a tonka of the wrathful form of Vajrapani um, sitting over my head during sleep. And the Tonkas in Bhutan are so extraordinary that I filled my house with them. This is my office space. And you can see somewhat out the windows, I just had this gorgeous view of the valley. And this is my shrine where I did my practice, my daily practice. This is my water system. 
So this is up on the hill behind me, and it's fed from the spring with that black tube on the right. And it's like a, I don't know, 50-gallon drum. It fills with water, and then it trickles down through a tube and creates enough pressure to fill my... Um, I just had one spigot in the house. This is the tube going back to the spring. It would break about every three days, and I'd have to find the break and repair it. This is my valley that I had the opportunity of living in. It's another view of the house. The local stream. This is a view from up behind my house looking towards Timpu Valley, which is the kind of big central capital city valley of the country. This is where I went to work every day. And this is the National Biodiversity Center. This is Timpu Valley. This is on a day hike. This is a very important monastery that is near Timpu. It's called Tango. And there's another one nearby. And it's just amazing how these little monasteries are just kind of tucked away in the cliffs. And you'll see some pictures towards the end of the slideshow of Tok Song, which is the most famous example of cliff dwellings in Bhutan. Here I am with my blonde hair and a friend. When we went on this day hike towards the top of this mountain, which we are headed to, we came across very fresh um, bear and leopard prints. And soon after that, Palm um, decided to head back to the car. <laughs> so this is the beginning of one of the mass dances. This is the dance of judgment. This big red figure kind of on the left that people are surrounding represents the Lord of Death. And this particular dance is very Catholic in the sense that it's all about judging whether the dead people who have been brought before the court, and these are, this is the jury, are worthy of heaven or hell. And so there's a white god, which you can kind of see in the middle to the right, and then there's a black demon, and which you can see there. And the black demon will sing the vices of the soul before the court, and the white god will sing the virtues. And at the end of each of the two songs, there's the sinner praying for forgiveness. At the end of the two songs, then one of the court members gets up with a scale and weighs you know, the virtues versus the vices. And in the case of the black sinner, a road... A black road is laid out and he's taken to hell. And there's a lot of dancing and singing. And this goes on for four hours. It's quite a long um, play drama. And then the white, the pious man who is here, he ends up being awarded heaven. But the black demon who holds court and all the jury members are in a sense kind of his buddies, they're not happy with that decision. So they try and take the white pious man to hell even though he's been granted heaven and the fairies have to come in and surround him and the fairies are kind of standing in the back there and they protect him energetically from the you know kind of the the evil folks and then they transport him to heaven with a white cloth and this is based on this particular dance is taken out of the Tibetan book of the dead which is also known as the Bardo Todde. And it's a very powerful dance. It's, it's pretty intense. And the older people come to watch this dance in particular as a way of reminding themselves of the journey that they're about to take into the Bardo and how important it is to, in a sense, purify one's karma so that you can be reborn um, in a, you know, in a, either a heavenly realm or in a good situation back in the earth plane. So the older folks pay particular attention to this dance. This is when the fairies surround the, the pious man and carry him off. This is 
at a temple that's in central Bhutan, which is kind of the heart of, of Bhutan. It's called Bhutan. And this temple behind the dancer was built in 659 AD, um, or I guess BCE. Um, and it's reported that there were there's a lake underneath the temple and there were a number of important scriptures that were revealed as terma from that lake. So here you can see the courtyard is grass versus the stone one we were looking at before. And this is a much more intimate setting. There's fewer people, but they're all kind of hovered around um, the dance floor. This is the place in Bhutan where the sacred naked monk dance takes place, which I spoke about a little bit last time. And at night, they have a bonfire on the grass, and about 12 monks from the age of, of like 10 to 18 come out naked and do a particular dance around the fire. Again, it being an example of the kind of Bhutanese and Vajrayana commitment to the sacred and the profane actually coming together and serving each other. So here you can see the drum. And the sound of the drum is reported to be the sound of pure dharma. And that if you listen intensely to the sound, you can become enlightened just by the very nature of its quality. Because it's stated that that sound contains the truth of all the scriptures. And it is actually a very beautiful sound when they, they bang it. Each of the animals represent different qualities and different aspects of tales, and it's all pretty complex. This is a sacred stupa that you're not supposed to get on, but the locals have climbed on it to get a better seat. And you can see the prayer flags flapping behind them. Here you can get a sense of the way they wear the mask. They look through the mouth or little holes that are drilled into the face of the mask, and then they cover their own mouth with a, a rag. And the fabrics are just absolutely gorgeous, some of which have been worn for over 100 years. Some of the masks were carved over 100 years. This is the, the dance of judgment being performed in this um, other valley. And you can see the Lord of Death there, and the white god, and the black demon, and then the, the jury. This is in the inner sanctuary. It just gives you an idea of the ornateness of architecture and painting there. And you can also see how worn that door is, um, and where people have come in and touched it as they've come in over the last three, four hundred years. Uh, this is upside down. But prayer, prayer wheels, which are everywhere. This is the giant red phallus I spoke of last time that they hang from the eve of their homes as a way of warding off evil spirits. And you can see kind of to the right or to the left of the phallus is what's a sword. Or that might actually be the phallus on the, the back eve. But normally the, the phallus is suspended with a sword actually also kind of hanging very near it. Um, and the sword is representing strength and kind of combativeness against the evil forces. This is part of the Zong, which is kind of the fortress or castle. And it historically has housed both the monk body and the state civil servants. So there's not a separation of church and state in Bhutan. But it's like four stories high, and there's not a single nail in any of that. It's quite impressive, their traditional architecture techniques. Thank you. Sean, who are the dancers? The dancers are generally monks. Usually monks that have been training to dance for a long time. So it's kind of considered to be part of their practice. And throughout the year they, you know, they dance and kind of keep up their skills. Um, and now it's such that 
there are some monk bodies that are known to have really good dancers, so they get hired out by other monasteries to come and dance um, because of their reputation. Throughout the country, you'll find Mani stones or the Mani uh, mantra carved into places and painted. And these are actually really big. Each letter is about four or five feet tall. This is a Mani wall that's about 10 yards long that you circumvent three times or six or nine. These are prayer stones with various scriptures. That stone is probably about as big as I am sitting down. So they're really, some of them are quite huge. Like there's no way you could lift it. It's, you can't even imagine how they got it there. Oh, there's that one again. This is another dance in yet another valley um, called Prakar. And this is the black hat dance, which is really famous and in many ways the most beautiful of all the dances um, just by the nature of the hats and the choreography. This is the cremation grounds dance and there's four skeletons that represent the four guardians of the four directions that look over the cremation grounds where individuals are either hacked up and fed to the vultures or they're burned. The black hat dances again. During the dance, as you'll see in some of the slides, one of the local children, they spin over and over and over again. They just spin incessantly, and you get dizzy watching it. Here's an example of the women coming out and doing a folk song and dance, and their voices are just, you really feel like you're listening to the muses. They kind of have a high pitch, but it's, it's very elegant. And they just do a real simple dance where they just basically rotate in a circle. You can see the demon on the front of the costume. He's probably got the best seat in the house because he's up above everyone. I mean, sometimes just sitting in these courtyards with this amazing stonework and the whitewash on the walls and the monks in their outfits and the dancers, like, it really was overwhelming aesthetically in a very wonderful way to just be confronted with just the history and the beauty and kind of the religious qualities. Here they're hacking up a clay, like a dough um, body that's sitting on the red triangle. There's a lot of, and you can see the red clown kind of behind him with his hands up to his face, and he's making fun of them by going, oh my God, oh my God, like, you're, you're killing them, you're killing them, stop, stop. You know, while, you know, this real important dance is going on where he's supposed to kill the clay figure. And you can kind of see how everyone's head is rotating because they're all spinning while this is happening. There you can get a sense of the dancing. This is in Pokhara, which is one of the few valleys. It's the only valley in Bhutan that's glacial, which means that it's wide and flat versus cut by a river. And it's one of the few wintering spots of the black neck crane, which homes in the summer in Tibet. And so it flies down for the winter and hangs out here. And this festival is has grown up around the black neck cranes and is designed to honor them and educate the locals about um, the need to conserve the valley. So the scouts come out and all the kids from the primary school and they do different dances and marches. And then this is one of several of the black neck crane dances where they mimic the cranes and kind of perform the courting ritual that the cranes go through. 
I think the most recent count of how many cranes had been wintering in this valley was around 300, which is considered to be a very high number given there's only about 5,000 left in the world. So the fact that this valley is a sanctuary for 300, it's considered to be really important. And it's the cranes are described in a number of the local ballads and songs. Here were two cranes that were looking on at the festival like the whole time. And it was almost as if they were watching the dancers to see if they got it right. <laughs> and it's said that when the cranes leave the valley, that they, there's a gompa, a monastery that sits up on the hill and overlooks the valley. And it's reported that each year as the cranes leave, they circumnavigate the gompa three times before they head to Tibet. Some of the locals. They have an art competition and they exchange the art done by the, with these students with a community in Japan that also is working on conservation of a particular crane that lives in that area. This is a yak which you got to see all over Bhutan if you were up high enough. And on our trek, we had fresh yak butter and yak milk um, with lots of yak hair in both. And was that both belong to a family? Yeah, and yet it's so odd because they're just roaming everywhere and you have no way of knowing how do they really keep track of all these critters roaming the hills, but they do. When you get up high, like about 12, 13,000 feet, and you get some of these views, you really start to get a sense of why the Tibetan tradition refers to the natural state of the mind as, as the sky, as, as the clarity and the crispness of the blue sky. It's really, I really had like a visceral experience of understanding why they refer to that expansiveness um, in trying to point to the mind's natural state, which was very different than when I've been out on the ocean or I've been in other places and had a wide open sky. There was some quality about the mountains being there and being so high and then having this expanse. There are prayer flags all over the place, up high. This is our camp at one point. I mean, the, the, the ruggedness of the train is just really unbelievable. This is reported that um, an ox, it's called Ox Lake, and an ox rose out of it at a certain point and gave some kind of teaching to some locals who were camping on the side. So everywhere you go, a lot of places have some kind of mythology or, or sacred story associated with it. I mean, this is actually the Himalayas. I'm not remembering all the names of those peaks, but it's part of the Himalayas. This is part of a workshop that I did um, connected to the project I was on. The gentleman in the front is Kinzong, who is the director of World Wildlife Fund in Bhutan. There I am with my counterpart, the woman I worked with while I was there, and I'm wearing the traditional dress, which is called a go. And it's kind of like a, a Scottish kilt. Each color represents a different prayer that's written on the fabric. Some are for long life, some are for money, some are for health, some are for, you know, blessings of, of various sorts. Some of the trees are just, you know, so compatible to the redwoods in a sense in terms of their girth and height and just awesomeness.
And please, if there are some questions that come up as I'm going, as Jim has done, go ahead and ask them and I can respond kind of on the fly. How are people there economically generally? Are they well off or satisfied? Yeah, yeah, pretty much because it has such a small population um, that it's been able to really kind of meet its needs. And the government has done a really good job of providing free health care, free education, and a lot of kind of services such as that. I mean, they're definitely poor by our standards, but they eat well and, you know, there's not a lot of disease or death. So, and it's agriculturally based, the economy. Yeah. What's your, the language they speak and did you speak it and do they speak English? They do speak English, um, thanks to the Brits and, and the Indians. They typically speak um, Zonka, which is a derivative of classical Tibetan. So it, think of classical Tibetan as Latin and Zonka as French or, or Italian. It kind of has that type of relationship. Um, you don't speak it? Oh, I speak Tibetan. Oh. Or I've, I've been studying Tibetan at the California Institute of Integral Studies. But it's hard to speak because I've been learning how to translate, which is kind of a different way of relating to a language. But it was nice because I could impress people by translating signs, even though I couldn't necessarily speak in conversation. And then they would obviously think that I was fluent and start talking to me, and I'd be like, oh, no, no. no, no. <laughs> so it, it's got me in trouble sometimes. This is a little, little um, temple on top of a hill, and when you get up to the temple, you see this. And it's just, it's so amazing. Would a blue flag have the same prayer significance all over Bhutan? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a yak herder's hut, kind of in the middle of the forest. And they had a really big dog that attacked Pete, um, who was about to be attacked as I was taking the picture. These are prayer wheels that are lined up behind the, the wood frame. This is a small little temple. This is an, a zong in Paro, and behind it is the lookout tower. And that small building has been turned into the National Museum. And it's really cool when you go in there and you kind of, you have to go, you have to circumnavigate in the museum because there's so many sacred objects held by the museum that you have to pay the kind of respect to them as if you were in a temple. I mean, the color, this is in the inside courtyard of the Zong. And they're just so fabulously decorated. So many colors and wood carving. I mean, it's it's just, again, it's like your eyes pop out and your heart just opens. This is a view from the Zong. This is inside the Zong again. This is where all the high muckety mucks hang out and discuss mm-hmm. business. Zong is a fort or castle that houses both the monk body officials and the civil servants. Are the orders of um, monastic orders similar to Tibetan Yeah, yeah, if not identical. This is that lookout tower up close. Yeah, the Bhutanese will tell you that their religion is very different than the Tibetan religion, but it's really not. Um, this is Tak Song, and you can see on the left that little white building on top. Um, if you jump over to the right, one kind of you know big rock, the rock in the middle, you can kind of see the white building on its face. And we'll get closer here. There you go. This is the most famous building in Bhutan and arguably in the entire Tibetan world. And it's, Tok Song translates as Tiger's Nest. 
and most of all the important saints came and meditated here. Yeah, there's a couple more pictures that highlight the extremity of this place. There, you get a sense of that it's a really complex structure, and it's just hanging on the cliff there. It burned down in 98. Internally, um, the fire swept through, and the building stood outside, but they've had to re-renovate it entirely. It was built like in the like ninth century, maybe even earlier, but at least by then. Because um, Pava Sabhava, also known as Guru Rinpoche, came and he flew here with his magical Sita capacities and meditated. And there's a rock cave that has holds the imprint of his body. What's that? No, there's just a little path um, that's actually kind of scary to walk on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they carried everything up on their back. This is the waterfall that's kind of in the crevice near that monastery. And right next to the waterfall is this meditation hut. And you can see the little ladder on the right that people use to go up to the hut. And if you go up into the hut and look out... Oh, it's coming up. Another picture of climbing up to it. This is one of the views of looking out of it. And you can see where the waterfall, the stream, just drops off right there. Is it climate milder than Tibet? Or what's it like in the winter? It's pretty cold. I think it's, it is milder, um, but it's still pretty cold and extreme. It's not as high as the plateau of Tibet. This is a friend exhibiting kind of the national dress for women. It's called a kira. And the fabric that she has around her waist, sometimes those fabrics can be so intricate. Like the Bhutanese have a standard of handwoven textiles that exceeds any in the world. And people are always going there to study um, how they do it. These are two close friends, both who work at the um, local radio station and TV station, Sering and um, Sewang. Yeah, I read they have cable now. Yeah, they just got they just got TV and internet two years ago. This How is that affecting the culture? in a big way. Um, there's been a few studies done on it, but it is impacting it. And there's a, the gap between the younger generation and the older generation is occurring more. This is my boss, Dr. Ugin Sewan, hard at work, which he actually never really was. But <laughs> <laughs> This is um, Karma, who took care of me. She worked out of the WWF office. And she was kind of my surrogate mother who looked after me and made sure my different papers were in order and that I had permits to go to different areas. And she was always concerned and, and just on the lookout. This is um, the guy I worked closely with with the project I was on, um, Chado. And this is Kinzong, the director of, of the entire office. Wonderful, wonderful man. Prayer flags everywhere. And the prayer flags get so thin by the rain and wind that they're, it's almost like you can put your hand through them if you were to touch them because they would just rip apart. They're just, after being on those poles for 30 years sometimes, they just are just so thin. Are they bleached? No, not those, but some of the others um, do have a bleach quality to them. Right, just a few more, and then we can open it up more to discussion. This is in Pokhara, where the cranes nest. And at the beginning of the festival, we got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and went out to where they roost so that we could wake up with them. 
and you know there was hundreds of them and you know making their little sounds and it was it was really beautiful this is me and Madone and the two consultants that we brought in one from India and one from the Netherlands to help with the project this is my friend Sonam who owns the best bar in Bhutan and who runs the only river rafting operation in the country some of the local plants from September 1st until almost February this is a temple high up in the mountains there's like one monk and, and his wife who live there to take care of it this is considered a sacred place where nature spirits live children watching the dances The thing I love about this picture is you can see that three kids have crawled under the throne of the Lord of Death in order to have one of the better views in the house. <coughs> Typical house. Most this is most Bhutanese live in a house like this. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Is there like a stable at the bottom floor? Yeah, the bottom floor is a stable. The top part, that little part you see up there, is where they dry the, the chilies and meat. And then they live in the middle section. And what are, what are the stones for? Those are to keep the shingles down because they don't have nails. So they take river stones. And, and, uh, the individuals who live in the house, do they build a house or do they, or do they just have house builders that they pay? They build it, yeah, usually with the... So, so, so the, the homeowners do all that ornate work and painting? Well, they usually hire a painter, or, you know, from the community do. to do it. Yeah. Are there windows on the, uh, on the other side? Yeah, they, the other side looks just like that and the two sides basically look like that. So there's kind of windows all the way around. But they don't have glass. No glass, yeah. Now they do, but traditionally they didn't. Would it be extended families or just mom and dad and a couple of kids? Extended with, you know, probably grandma and gramps and maybe a cousin or two. What would the gay life be like for somebody living there? <laughs> yeah. Um, I spoke a little bit about that the last time, but since there's a lot of new folks, I'll recap a few things most people that I spoke to because I actually was very interested in gender and and gay life in Bhutan so I asked a lot of people and the general consensus was people were pretty open to it and accepting the king is known to have a gay uncle and it's also con known that or it's reported that the monks often engage in sexual activity and that's kind of understandable or you know that that's acceptable in many cases there were some people who complained about um, foreign travelers coming over and kind of picking up on young kids um, so I heard that a couple times um, but yeah there seemed to be a pretty pretty accepting and open um, attitude towards homosexuality These are just kind of some of the best of pictures. Was the spinning um, a trans induction? Yeah, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if historically it served something like that because they do look like whirling divishes. And they must, it must affect them to spin like that for two hours. No, because the government of Bhutan has passed legislature that um, requires that the country always have at least 62% of its country forested. And in fact, they have 70%. So 
as a country, they've exceeded kind of the legal requirement of forest cover. And that's one of the reasons why I went there was because of policies like that. I wanted to understand what do they really look like and were people supportive of those kinds of policies at the local levels or was that just a government kind of imposing certain standards? Um, I think the biggest thing going for them has been a low population. And I think they're going to have a harder time as the population increases. And the other thing is that it's so steep in Bhutan that if you cut down the trees, you have your agricultural capacity. Um, is there a good family planning program? Yeah, there, there are a number of educational programs that emphasize planning that. Um, but Bhutan is re- considered to have the highest growth population growth um, percentage in Asia. It's like at 3%. Um. Is there a, the reason I asked my economic question is that is there any danger of the market county invading the country because they have uh, some sort of precious resources or something? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. The king is a really what I would consider an enlightened leader. and He's been doing a lot to try and be one or two steps ahead of that. And, for example, one way they've done it is to charge $250 a day for visitors. So tourism is kept to a minimum because people can't afford that. And if they can't afford it, they usually can only afford it for like 10 days. Um, So the amount of kind of Western individuals coming in to the country is, is pretty small. And... And yet, the private sector is growing. People are wanting to have Western items, you know, dishwashers, TVs, cars. A lot of people are buying Land Rovers. And, like, you see all these monks, these really big, fat monks in their saffron and red robes driving, you know, huge Land Rovers, like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 vehicles. Um, so it's, there's, there's some interesting ironies, for sure, in the country. But I think Bhutan's really only been open to the world, well, since 60s, like mid-60s, but really only in the last, like, 15 years. Um, And one of the ways they deal with their resources, like, they have India pay them as a carbon sink. And what that means is because Bhutan has these huge forests, they say to India, and they make an agreement with the international community that, okay, India has all this pollution they're creating, we have all these trees that are absorbing the pollution. So if India pays us a certain amount of money, we won't cut down our trees and we'll allow India to keep producing a certain level of pollution. I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons to that kind of arrangement, but it's been one way that Bhutan's tried to preserve some of its natural resources is by, in a sense, having the countries around them pay them for them to keep them intact. Um, there's not a whole lot of mining. There is some, um, but not too much. It's mostly agricultural products. Mushrooms, in particular, go for a lot on the market, especially for the Japanese, and timber products, and some like rare animal parts that are sold on the black market for, you know, medicinal reasons. You know, like tigers' penises and tiger gallbladder and stuff like that. How, how independent are they of India? Not very. When, when Tibet got taken over by China in the mid-century, Bhutan was really scared that something similar might happen to them. So at that point, they decided to create diplomatic relations with India, which up to then they had avoided. Um, and so they kind of made friends with India as a way of keeping China at bay should it turn its sights on Bhutan. And as a result, India has grown very closely with Bhutan diplomatically, economically, politically over the last 50 years. And there's a lot of Indians there. Um, I think it's a good relationship. I don't think it's been abused too much, but they definitely are very tied to India in some ways. One other question. How, how are the monasteries supported? Do they own land or do they get subsidies? 
both. They, they do own land, the government supports them, and the local communities support them. It's very common that people who have crops, they are sp- supposed to donate like the first the first intake of the new harvest to the monastery to support the monks so there's kind of this ritual of taking your the, the first batch of grains you've harvested up to the monastery it's just like ancient Israel, right? yeah the first fruits. yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Since, um, the king is quite enlightened what will happen or is he as far as succession and yeah. his policies, because I heard he, he has great impact on what's going on now. Right, it's a good question. He has been, a, he's done a number of things. One, he's made several speeches saying that Bhutan should not be ruled on blood, that it should have elected leaders. And, and with that statement, he's began to write himself out of a job and he's done it in several ways. One, about 10 years ago, he ins- instituted a, a, a no-confidence vote, where every three years the National Assembly gets together and they vote whether or not they have confidence in the king. And if a majority of them vote no confidence, then the king is ousted and they have to elect a new king um, or a new ruler. Because everyone loves the king so much, they're all, no one would ever vote no confidence, so a few years ago, there were a few votes of no confidence, which surprised everyone. And rumor has it that he stuffed the ballot box with a few no confidences <laughs> as a way of kind of communicating to them that it's okay if you feel this way to vote this way, you know. And so he's done that, and then he's had the National Assembly begin to draft a constitution, um, a, you know, very kind of one that's very much in alignment with the kind of constitution we have and so forth. And he's been creating kind of a checks and balances of, again, very similar to our you know, three branches of government. And he was he spent a lot of time in England and in Western countries, so he's very familiar with kind of the, the democracy and, and how it can look and what its problems are. And he's doing a lot to kind of get it to a point so that when he does die, Bhutan will be able to move into its next phase of, of governance that won't be so you know heavily reliant on a single individual. Uh, How are women treated? Women are treated, by and large, really well. Better than women I've seen treated in almost every country I've traveled in. They have a lot of power. It's, it's said that they can divorce a man just by leaving. And the land is passed down through her um, and they just in general seem to respect women largely there still is a very strong patriarchal aspect to the culture women aren't allowed in certain parts of the temple they're not allowed to touch certain things you know so you see those elements there but you also see um, a lot of empowerment of the women and the women feel like they have a lot of power and control and I, after being there for five months, I started to feel like they didn't have as much power and control as they thought. You know, kind of having you know a feminist critique and a you know kind of perspective from the West that views those issues in a different way than, than they were. And so I found it interesting that they felt that they had certain you know kind of rights and responsibilities and were proud of that. And I was kind of going. Well, I think you should ask for more, actually. You know, but you know, but it was nice to see women in a culture who felt like, hey, we're in control. We we, we have a lot of say in what goes on. Uh, so yeah, good question. Yeah. What's the uh, size of the country and the population? I just never saw Bhutan on the map. And yeah, know. it's about half the size of Nepal geographically, which is pretty small, and population-wise, no one knows. But they, th- the the general statistic that's thrown out is 600,000, um, so it's somewhere between that and a million. And but no one really knows because they fudge on the consensus in order to get more aid. Any last question? As I think we're towards the end. 
Well, great. Thank you so much for having me. And, Thank you. and if you have additional questions, I'll be hanging out, you know, in the lobby for you know a little bit. So please feel free to come up and chat. Oh, thank you. I have. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you now have a lifetime connection with Bhutan and will be going back regularly? Yeah, I do. In fact, Vipassana and I are thinking of trying to go back in March with our Buddhist Sangha out of San Rafael, mm-hmm. and they're doing a pilgrimage there. And yeah, the people are so lovely, the country's so beautiful, and the religion's so amazing. Mm-hmm. So I think I'll go back as much as I can afford. <laughs> we get paid at 250, whatever it was a day. Yeah, no, because now I have good connections <laughs> <laughs> that I can get like a visitor visa. GBF retreat, which is now in three weeks. Uh, there are new flyers outside for it. It's in Vajrapani, which seems appropriate having looked at these, though it is it is deep in the redwood forest, uh, with a lot of sun still coming through rather than in the mountains. But it's just a, a wonderful place. The last the last uh, three miles are by dirt road, though it's, it's quite passable. Uh, and it's the weekend of Friday, September 6th through Sunday, September 8th. And the period for the discounted price is now just passed, uh, and the private cabins are all taken up, uh, but we still have people for the uh, dormitory spaces and tenting where most people stay. And it's just a, a really beautiful space that we've had wonderful retreats at in the last few years. So um, I want to encourage people to pick up the flyers and uh, send in their deposit and let us know that they're coming so we'll know how many people to plan for it. Thank you. George. A reminder that talks are available at the GBF website at gaybuddhist.org. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.